Hello and welcome to another edition of IMO Bastani with me, Aaron Bastani, at Aaron Bastani on Twitter. As ever, thank you so much for watching. This week I want to talk about the last general election. You know the one I'm talking about, May 2015, Linton Crosby, the Ed Stone. Everybody, the pollsters, most analysts and even myself saying we would only get a hung parliament. Of course we didn't. The Tories confounded nearly everyone by winning a majority. They have a majority of 12 in Westminster. Since then, the last 12 months, at Navarra Media and elsewhere, of course, people have been looking at those results and saying, well, how did the Tories manage to do this? How did they manage to defy expectations and win this thing? And how do we get things so terribly wrong? Now, however, it looks like we've got an explanation as to how the Tories managed to do this, at least to some extent. So what is it? Well, it seems that they misallocated spending. It seems potentially that they broke the law. So how did they do this? Well, the Electoral Commission says there are two uh, streams of spending during a general election. There is the central party campaign spending, you know, for national adverts and stuff like that. And then there's the spending done by candidates at the local level within the constituency. That is capped. The second spending is capped. It depends on the size of the electorate, the size of the constituency. But in a general election, it's between 10 and 16,000 pounds. Those two streams also have to be kept separate. Right? Very, very important. One can't bleed into the other. What seems to have happened in the last general election, however, is that central spending was going into local spending. So people contesting uh, elections, almost always in marginal seats, by the way, against Labour and against the Lib Dems in the South West, were getting far more money to mobilise people on the ground to get leaflets through the door than they were legally permitted to. The Tory battle bus, battle bus 2015, was part of central party spending, right? That's the part which isn't capped. Like I said, the part which is capped is local campaign spending, right? What seems to have happened is the battle bus was deployed in marginal seats. It was in the southwest, it was in the northwest, and it was in the Midlands. What was it doing? It was basically ferrying around activists to key marginals to knock on doors to get out the vote, okay? That's not what battle buses are meant to do. 29 seats were implicated. Um, they were visited by the battle bus. If this was a centrally funded resource which was helping the local campaign, it would mean that around 24 of those campaigns went over the spending limit. They broke the law. In 24 of those seats, the Tories won 22 of them, right? So it's pretty fair to say that this battle bus, which Tory chiefs knew was in breach of the rules, was specifically targeting marginal seats to get out the vote and get the Tories to win. This is not an accident, right? And the whole point of a battle bus is not to go to marginal seats. Because, like I say, this is meant to be funded by the central party operation. This is part of the national campaign. This is about appealing to the media. It's about getting on the BBC, getting on Sky News, right? Why would you be sending it to marginal? That doesn't matter. This is about the national campaign, not local campaigns. Unless, of course, it wasn't about the national campaign. It was about the local campaign and just the local campaign. Given that, like I said, it went to 29 seats, 24 of which breached the rules, 22 of which they won. I think the battle bus went to basically all these southwest seats they took off the Lib Dems. It went to all these marginals where they beat Labour in the Midlands. And, you know, they didn't do anything in the northwest, but places like Bolton. Um, very dodgy, right? I mean, there's not really much of an explanation. The Tories, of course, have come back and said, well, look, this is an admin error. We confuse local for national campaign spending. That campaign was conceived by Mark Clark. You may have heard of this guy, the now disgraced Tatler Tory, which one isn't? I'm sure they all read the Tatler, right? This guy was responsible, some say, some allege, for the suicide of a Tory activist called Elliot Johnson. He's a disgraced guy, Mark Clark now, right? This was his brainchild. He was saying we can use the battle bus in this way to assist local campaigns on a day-by-day -day basis over the last 10 days of the campaign. That's not just me saying this, okay? Channel 4 has documentary evidence that clearly states this. That seems to break the rules. That seems to break the law, of course. We'll see how things progress. But hold on a second, not so fast. Go back 12 months, 2014. There were three by-elections, weren't there? There were three by-elections where there was a Tory MP and UKIP were looking to do pretty well, right? Rochester and Stroud, Clacton on Sea, and uh, Newark. And in each of them, UKIP had a real chance. Now, you may not recall this now because UKIP, of course, have just got one seat. They saw a flop at the last general election. But in 2014, they were riding the crest of a wave. Polling was high. There was talk of many Tories defecting to UKIP. Why didn't that happen? Well, in large part, it's because UKIP's results in those three by-elections were kind of underwhelming. Okay, so Douglas Carswell, he won Clacton on Sea. Uh, Mark Reckless, yes, he won uh, Rochester and Stroud, but the majority was really low. And of course, then they lost in Newark. 
What that meant was that other Tory MPs were really not so sure about defecting, right? Because Reckless defected, but it was clear his majority was so small, he would probably lose the next general election, right? We now know that the Tories spent, in those three by-elections, around £100,000 more than they were legally allowed to. Rochester and Strood, by the way, was, I think, uh, £50,000. Incredible, right? And the, these were only by-elections. There was no national campaigns. There's no admin error here. Which brings us, of course, to Nigel Farage. Nige, 2015 election. Like I say, in a lot of really tight seats, they've sent the battle bus, they've gone over the spending limit, right? What's happened in South Thanet really takes the biscuit, however. So the limit there, I think, was 16,000. The local Tory candidate, uh, I think, spent just under the legal limit, right? But actually, they didn't declare a lot of expenses. So it was found that around, I think, 18,000 pounds was spent on just two hotels of Tory activists, right? One of which was 800 meters outside of the constituency border for South Thanet, okay? Now, these were people that were campaigning for the Tories against UKIP. They spent almost double the legal limit in that constituency in the last general election. Why do they do that? And why against Nigel Farage? Now, I'm not a fan of Nigel Farage. I hate the guy's politics, right? But these are the facts. They knew that Farage winning a seat, just Farage winning a seat and them keeping Carswell in, 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 um, in Claxon on sea, that would be a success for UKIP. And the big historic concern for the Tories, not for this year, next year, for the next five years, is UKIP can't get momentum, right? They can't get that right-wing vote. That was a real concern for them. What's more, the prospect of Nigel Farage being an MP in the House of Commons in the year leading up to Brexit? Unthinkable. They weren't gonna let it happen. That's why it seems they broke the rules, they broke the law. So why hasn't the media covered it, you know? Why aren't the media on this like a fly to the proverbial? Well, now I know some of you out there will be going, oh my God, here we go. Here is another Aaron Bastani special. He's gonna lose the plot. He's gonna say the media bias, all this stuff. I'm actually not gonna say that. Clearly there are, there are legal issues at hand. Clearly if people say things against individuals, election agents, MPs, Lord Feldman, Grant Shops, and they're proved to be wrong, that's defamation of character, right? So there are legal issues at hand, I understand that. Notwithstanding, Michael Crick is harassing Lord Feldman right, down Whitehall. Uh, Andrew Neil is quizzing Grant Shapps, asking whether he knew about people breaking the law on uh, the daily politics, right? So if they can do it, surely other journalists can do it too. I think the explanation for why this isn't being covered, really, is twofold. One is there is a timidity here, which means that more senior journalists, really experienced hacks, right, and Andrew Neil and Crick, whatever their flaws are, definitely that. They're loving this. They're going for it. Maybe other people are kind of more reticent in addition to that, however, look, this is huge. And I think a lot of people have taken a step back and they've just in the last couple of days, right, the last week, they've looked at this story and they've gone, my God, this is huge. This could implicate some really important people. This brings into question the credibility, the legitimacy of the last general election results, for goodness sake. That's massive. How high up does this go? So. Yes, it's not been covered hitherto, but this is not going to go away. I think more people are seeing the size and the scope of this story. It's going to have to be covered because, quite frankly, the media has no choice. This is one of the smallest majorities in, in, in British parliamentary history. I think it's the smallest majority since, like, the mid-70s, right? Since 74 or something. So there would be a clear reason, clear incentives for them to break the rules like they did. The surprise is how flagrant it seems to have been. What's more, and for me this is more important in the long term, is how they try to completely undermine, destroy UKIP before they could scale. Like I say, 2014, UKIP were really looking dangerous. They were coming off the back of very successful European election results, polling well. They were looking at serious numbers of defections, I think. There were talks about it at the time, you know, you were looking at maybe a dozen Tories defecting. What stopped them was Reckless's result in Rochester and Strood. When that majority wasn't as big as people thought it was going to be, then I think a lot of Tories really went, oh, hold on, I'd like a job after next year, thank you very much. We now know they spent 50 grand more than they should have there. Interesting, isn't it? It looks like the Tories were almost willing to make sure UKIP could never take a big share of their vote important places mattered right in 2015. They didn't mind them taking Labour's vote, but just not theirs, not the right-wing vote. And it looks like they could almost go to any length to make sure that that wouldn't happen. And look, if the CPS don't process this thing, take it all the way, it's fair to say Nigel Farage will. He'd have good grounds to, right? Uh, nothing's gonna please this guy more than bowling out of the old Bailey, 
court rules in his favor. There's another bile action, right? You can see him going up to the camera, probably in his barber. The guy probably wear a barber and wellies into the courtroom. And he'll say, look, this is a great day for you, Kip. It's an even better day for British justice. Go to the pub over the road, have a pint of ale. He's gonna love it, right? What's more, this whole thing kind of gives credibility to UKIP about being an anti-establishment party, right? It's like horse manure to the conspiracy theories they have about how the Tories do anything to keep them down. That's really, really dangerous, especially, especially in the run-up to the next general election. So what do you think? You know what I think? When normal everyday people overclaim on benefits, it's called fraud. When Tory politicians overclaim on election expenses, it's called an admin error. Why don't you put those thoughts down on the hashtag, hashtag I am Obastani, or reach out to me on Twitter at Aaron Bastani and Navara Media, at Navara Media.